huge amount of different options that I had on the instrument. I was like, this is so much to comprehend in one go. So I just kind of, I decided to take a more intuitive approach to it. I was introduced to today's guest by jazz, bass, mainstay, and past podcast guest, and just overall great guy, John Goldsby. We are chatting today with Helen Svoboda, who's exploring a variety of interesting solo projects, collaborative projects. Uh, some of them include her Vegetable Bass series. Yes, very interesting. And we talk about that. Her bass and tenor sax duo, Meat Shell, and her chamber-oriented project, Sprout. Do you detect a theme? Yes, we get into that. Uh, Helen is just such a cool artist. One of those people that I watch her videos and I get sucked in and I think, how is she doing that? And then I go over to the bass and explore. I know I found an interesting artist when I do that. That only happens to me every once in a while uh, to that degree. Helen is just all good things, super good people. And you're going to love this conversation. Quick shout out to our sponsors, Upton Bass, Steve Swan, String Bass, D'Addario Strings, Modacity, The Bass Violin Shop, Colstein Music, and A440 Violin Shop. More on them later, but let's hear a bit of Helen performing here in the intro and at the end of our chat and look up all these projects. And they're just so fun to listen to and watch at her website, helensfoboda.com. I'm going through the the solo bass project, and I have all my notes in front of me here. Um, so that's the vegetable bass. Yeah, yeah, that is vegetable bass. <laughs> okay, okay. Which and I love, I love sprout, and I love all your uh, your uh, the the commonality in the names of your various projects, except uh, meat shell, which I guess is yes. it's kind of like the opposite, yeah. but. That one is the opposite, and we didn't actually purposely call it meat shell for it to be opposite. We just thought of two words that sound really strange together, and then we were thinking it's kind of like another word for skin, I guess, because if you think of the skin, it's like a shell for our meat. It's really mm -hmm. abstract. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's where that came from. <laughs> well, it's cool. And so like both the meat shell or what you've done recently, and then some of these solo bass pieces... Uh, utilizing, I actually, John Goldsby, you know, sent me info about you and it, and I, I was listening. I'm like, wow, it's exactly what he described. He said, she's using her voice in conjunction with harmonics and doing some pizzicato and some extended techniques and, and these different structures. I'm like, wow, that's exactly what I'm hearing, but it's, it's yeah. super cool. And, and, um, th this latest, so this, uh, vegetable base is your first straight up solo project, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's it's been kind of brewing for a few years, but I just didn't feel quite ready to embark on it until I did my master's because, yeah, in Brisbane, you kind of, in your studies, you get all of the straight ahead jazz training and that's great. But then I just didn't get any training in the world of extended techniques or even lots of ARCO trainings was non-existent in my um, jazz studies, which looking back is, yeah, it's something that's a little bit... Um, you know, it's like very necessary to actually get that in your bachelor's, in my opinion, now, because compared to the education here, which was great, but then going to Germany and having half my lessons in Germany, half of them in Netherlands, it's just, it's completely a requirement there, you know, to know how to play the instrument to that next level on a, even a classical level. Um, so yeah, since I graduated from my bachelor. I've just been focusing in my own time for a few years. I was working full time here and just, yeah, getting some classical lessons on the instrument and then just found that it wasn't progressing fast enough. So I just thought, you know what, I just got to move somewhere and just focus for two years. Um, and since then, yeah, then I've really taken on a lot of the extended techniques, used the voice a lot more. So, yeah, it was kind of the right time to start it now, um, a few years after my first studies, I guess. Yeah. Well, it's like it's like a whole new sonic world opening up, you know, when you get it. To, yeah. and, and it's just so it's so interesting um, out here. In, I live in San Francisco out here in California, uh, Southern California. Mark Dresser is is well known for for exploring that. And I, I had the chance to I've, I've known Mark for years, but I had the chance to sit in and watch Mark teach some lessons and going through some of this contemporary repertoire and then just like 
talking about his projects and, and the way he's mapped out all these different things on the base. I mean, it's just, it's unbelievable. You think this wooden box with four strings, but the, yeah. the, the just layers upon layers of, of what you can do. And, and what you're doing is like, I've never heard anything exactly like, like what you're exploring, like in terms of like, you've, you've got some of these percussive bow techniques and you're like, also sort of striking the string and like activating yep. different partials. It's so, where, where did all yep. that come from? I mean, well, who are some of the people, maybe some influences or I, just tell me yeah. about that. Um, well, it's funny you mentioned Mark because I saw him perform in Cologne just a few months ago. Um, so I met him briefly and that was just awesome to watch him perform because I've, I've known his music and him, you know, of him for many years now, but just to see it, it's you're totally right. You just see it live, and you go, "Wow, that's he's bringing out so much from the instrument that you you wouldn't think possible, really." So like, he would be one. Mm -hmm. um, Bar Phillips is another huge influence of mine. He just, I remember when I first heard of him and discovered his music, it literally opened up my whole my whole world. So I think he was actually a huge influence in vegetable bass um, ongoing. So. Um, there's also even like going back to more the jazz side of things, it's more Charlie Hayden even mm -hmm. is one of my favorites. Mm -hmm. Um, cause he's just so melodic and yeah, he was kind of one of the first bass players I heard in, in jazz where I was going, wow, this is just really spoke to me mm -hmm. straight away just from his kind of simplicity, but also you just know that it's him straight away. So yeah, out of bass players, they would be like my top three, I reckon. I'd have to say. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I think I, on your blog, you mentioned in passing, at least, uh, Larry Grenadier's recent solo album. And it's, it's interesting because I'm, I listened to you. I'm like, wow, she, she has uh, uh, extremely sophisticated uh, arco technique and, and, and just uh, can explore the instrument. And it's like, you know, yeah. what is jazz anyway? I guess we could talk about that forever. But like, you know, yeah. the, you, you, what you do is, is, I mean, jazz would be a word to describe it, but you do many other things too. And I think about that with Larry and that recent album too. I mean, it's, okay. it's, it's just, it's just marvelous. He played a so, uh, recital of solo. Well, it was basically that album, but solo. And then with his wife singing uh, in oh. 20, 2017 here in the States. And so it was really cool to see that. I'm happy you mentioned him too, because actually, yeah, he was someone I would have, I would have listened back later and thought, oh, no, I forgot to mention that because John John Goldsby actually showed me his solo album in the first place and just said, check this out. And, yeah, it's just beautiful, like stunning. And also, yeah, like you said, the word jazz, it's like it, is that what you would use to describe his album? And it's it's hard to say because I find it's it's hard kind of coming from jazz jazz training in my bachelor and all of these jazz players out there doing so many different things with the instrument as well it's like it's hard to put a, a label on what what we're all doing in that kind of world which is cool in itself I guess <laughs> what what is the name for the master's program you're doing right now I looked it up and I forgot it but it's something about like solo performance or something along those lines what do you remember I, I actually can't remember the exact name but it's basically it's a master's of jazz performance you know so that can mean anything these days <laughs> so you know, I I just kind of, I went in with my proposal for solo double bass development, looking at weaving vegetables into my compositions and they accepted it. So it was great. <laughs> uh, okay. So I, I have been exploring more the kind of extended techniques world and, you know, de de uh, uh, very, very conservatively along some of the lines of what I'm, but I, I, and I've been showing some of my students these techniques and it's so fascinating. And then the next question that they have, and I certainly have is like, how the heck do you practice this stuff or then weave into your composition? So just tell me how that works for you. You how, like, maybe how did that evolve? And like, how, how do you, how do you practice and compose and using these? Yeah. Um, I struggled with that for a few years as well, because after um, I started to discover different sounds and look into different players and different, you know, approaches, I was really overwhelmed by first of all, the notation of it all. Um, by the huge amount of different options that I had on the instrument. I was like, this is so much to comprehend in one go. So I just kind of, I decided to take a more intuitive approach to it, which has been really good in my lessons in Cologne as well with Sebastian Grums. Um, he's been awesome for that because I kind of, I went into my first lesson and I said, 
teach me all of the things. And he's just like, no. <laughs> he's like, you have to figure out which ones you like and figure out how to apply them in a creative context as well because otherwise they're just techniques and you don't really know what they're useful for. So that's where my project came from is like I'm forcing myself in my compositions to actually focus on one or two specific approaches or techniques that I'm learning or just discovering intuitively as well and labeling each composition with the vegetable and then straight away it's like okay what does this kind of sound like to me does it sound like beetroot or does it sound like artichoke and straight away it's been a really useful way to apply the new ones because I'm taking it out of just the practice of it and putting it into a full-scale composition and you know attaching a kind of humorous I guess label to it so um yeah that would be how I I managed to navigate that huge world of of options I think <laughs> so kind of limiting the options in some of these I think I think you mentioned also on your blog working with uh John Clayton at some point and just talking yeah. about clarity of ideas is that kind of along those lines yeah definitely yeah I, we, he came to Maastricht for one day and I had a lesson with him and and I I played in some of my stuff and he was like that's great um but just make sure you're like focusing on clarity rather than putting everything into the same, same three minutes, you know, you can kind of spread out your ideas and really focus on each one a little bit more to get the most out of it. Mm -hmm. So yeah, simplifying and taking my time has been the most important thing that I'm doing on this and not to finish the two years of masters and go, I know all of them now because I won't. So <laughs> You know, I've, I've, I've accepted that now. It's okay. <laughs> it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's a very cool. You know, I, talking about those extended techniques, I wonder if part of the reason why they're not, it, maybe there just aren't that many people that have that knowledge, that have that, you know, because like I, I think about like, if I was going to recommend somebody in the States go, and I'm probably going to miss a bunch of names, so apologize to people listening, but like I would, Robert Black, Mark Dresser, you know, I, I, the, the, I'm, I'm starting to run out. I, I mean, I can maybe think of a few other names, but there's just not that many people in, in that world. And, and so maybe that's part of the challenge. It's hard to teach something that you haven't, that you don't have like in your, in your wheelhouse. Yeah. The word extended techniques is a little bit tricky because it sounds really daunting to me at least. Um, but when, when you kind of approach it in a musical way and straight away integrate it into just um, more common techniques, I think it's immediately more accessible and more normalized. Mm -hmm. At least that's been my experience. Yeah. <laughs> well, are you um, with these, these uh, vegetable based pieces, are you then, have you written anything down in notation or is this all within your mind at this point? I'm sure it's of course being done already, but of different ones that I've discovered myself and explain in depth how they are notated, how to approach it. It's a tricky one. <laughs> How do I communicate this to someone who's never heard it, doesn't know me, is approaching it maybe from a different country? It's like the hardest thing. Yeah, I need help. I need help. <laughs> it's something that maybe, um, maybe once we, maybe like eventually every piece will also have an accompanying video where you can show like how to do some of these things because it's so confusing. And I think you, you had a notation example on your blog too, uh, of, of just harmonics or something like that. And, and I find that, yeah. I find that so confusing just, you know, in, in whatever type of repertoire, orchestral repertoire, solo bass repertoire, like where is it? How do we notate it? It's a real, uh, th that, that language is still evolving. Oh yeah. And the different ways to even notate a specific one thing I find they're always with the harmonics, especially there are a few different ways to notate them always. And, and it's choosing which one is the most accessible on a reading level, which I, I, I just think that if I was trying to read the notations that I've done without having done them myself, it would just be, you just look at it and just be like, what, <laughs> what is this? Like what is this mishmash of stuff on a page? And it's just in the end, I think that's again with the extended techniques, it's hard to always communicate them to the player. Like, you know, it's becomes quite intuitive once you know how to do it or if someone just shows you straight up how to do it. But if you don't have that and you're just trying to decipher this score um, and 
just figure it out from there. It, it can be really scary from my own experience um, until someone just shows you or you see a video exactly like videos would be important, I think, of this just to have a two-minute, three-minute instructional video on like this is not scary. You can do it yourself. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, I, yes. I agree. Um, it's a, a topic that endlessly fascinates me and, and I you probably think about a lot too, but I also saw some hints of that on, on your blog is just like the daily practice or the regular practice of creativity. And I think, I think you have one post about just like 30 seconds of creativity. It was like a video. You're like, you were it sounded like you were burned out and you got back and like, rather than do nothing, you at least do something small. And that resonates so strongly with me. Like I try to, it, it's not typically composing on the bass or composing, but I try to, to kind of push that creative you know, ball forward every day. How does that work for you? Do you try to write every day? Uh, what, what, how does that practice look like for you? Yeah, I guess um, in my master's, especially because I came from almost full-time work in Brisbane, burnt out there, went to master's mm -hmm. specifically to have the time to focus on, on that. Um, again, just a regular practice routine. Mm -hmm. And I'm actually, I'm really bad at um, maintaining a regular practice routine because my brain just goes in a million different places at once. So I'll do one thing and I'll be like, Oh, it's going to practice a scale, but actually that sounded cool. So let's go straight to this and just jumps all the time. <laughs> um, which I've had to kind of figure out, I think for what I'm doing, that's okay, but I need to still focus sometimes. Um, but yeah, I, I always find recording myself and at least just forcing myself to notate, um, and establish at least part of a composition every week. Mm. So just doing little sketches, um, just little ideas or motifs that I might find I'm doing my practice where it's like, oh, I like this sound, let's do something with it. And yeah, limiting myself, like that 30 second one, I was completely not in the headspace to practice that day, but I had a whole day free. So I was like, well, damn, gotta, gotta do it. <laughs> <laughs> and forcing myself to, to actually form a full composition of the new Mitchell album, which, you know, it, anything can happen from those moments when you just kind of force yourself, limit yourself and have to make do with what you've got. I think it's actually great in not all the time, but that time it was. <laughs> so Samuel Colstein, who founded Colstein and Sons, back 70 years ago at this point, Sam was largely self-taught. Here's Barry Colstein about how his father got into the business. You know, it was mainly self-taught, yeah. but but he I will pay homage to people that need to be paid homage. He did study a bit with Al Eisenstein, who was a great repairman in Manhattan. He was considered one of the top. And Al was very gracious. He allowed my father to sit at his side, watch him work. But a lot of it was self-taught. My father was very ing ingenious a person. He really would look at a problem and figure out five ways of, of doing it and then choose the right way always. Ever since those early years, Colstein and Sons has been working to solve problems for bass players, provide them with ever better instruments and new opportunities in terms of travel bases and cases and all sorts of things that we need as bass players. Thank you, Barry, and thank you, Colstein, for everything that you do and for sponsoring the podcast. Are you ever curious just what kind of production capacity a company like Upton Bass has? Here's Gary and Eric from Upton Bass on how many bases they're turning out every year. How many instruments to date in America, Togwonk, Business Park, Mystic here entirely in the US, do we approximately? Just completely ourselves? Yes. I think probably up over 1,600 now. Yeah. Right. Okay. Right. That's coming, so. up, coming up around 1,700. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. The evolution of the product line over these almost 1,700 bases at this point is so cool. From the Gary Carr model to the Bohemian and Bostonian and all the other things that they do at Upton. I just really enjoy their instruments and I have for years and years. Thank you so much for sponsoring the podcast. Upton and check them out online at UptonBase.com. This episode is brought to you by the Bass Violin Shop, which opened in 2001 as a small double bass workshop in Greensboro, North Carolina. Today, they're staffed by three full-time, highly skilled bass luthiers, and they specialize in double bass sales, rentals, setup, restoration, and repair. For nearly 20 years, they have satisfied thousands of clients by offering quality instruments, knowledgeable service, reliable repairs, and superior restoration at affordable prices. They're always happy to 
assess bases for trade-in, consignment, or even purchasing outright. Contact them to schedule a time to discuss your base and your future needs. For more information and current inventory, visit their website at BaseViolinShop.com and be sure to follow them on Facebook and Instagram. Hello, my name is Klaus Freudenstein. I'm a double bass player and educator based in Germany. I'm working in quite a lot of fields. So one is I'm the founder of the double bass quartet, the Bass Monsters. We are playing rock tunes on four double basses in a very chamber music way. And we're about to release a new CD with many real bass monsters playing on it and I'm already very much looking forward to launch it. Have a look on the Bass Monsters website. Also, beside this, I'm the inventor of the mini bass. 15 years ago, I invented the so-called Freudenstein mini bass that you can also check out on minibass.com. Beside this, I'm also the writer of music. I have published uh, some books. One is a method for the mini bass. It's called mini bass, available in Hofmeister Publishing, also in English language. And if you know someone uh, that likes it in Chinese language, there is also an issue pu published. Also, I have published a piece called the bass hymn that should include many different player levels. So in one piece, you can play with professors on the double bass standing beside mini bass players that just started to play. Also, I have published a, a book called It's Christmas with Christmas carols for double bass quartet. And soon there will be out a new piece called The Wolf. And also in this book is the piece Struct. Well, I'm also the organizer and artistic director of the Bavarian Bass Days that you can also check out in the internet, an international bass meeting with many styles. I was the board of, I was on the board of directors of the ISB for, for some years. Now I'm in the uh, advisory board of the ISB and for the ISB, I also wrote articles in the bass world. I do international master classes and mini bass workshops. So you see, it's a lot of stuff. Also my project Crossing Borders, which is a project that includes solo music for double bass in piano that is all more or less arranged or written for me. And of course, beside this, I'm a teacher. I'm teaching quite a lot of students in all ages. And for all of that, I'm using Kaplan strings from Dadario. Uh, yeah, I really love them and also my colleagues in the Bass Monsters are very happy with them. We are using the Kaplan solo in the Bass Monsters and for all the rest of the things that I'm doing, I use uh, the Kaplan Heavy that really give me a powerful, deep and clear projecting sound. So far, that's it from my side. Thank you for listening, Klaus Freudenstein. This episode is brought to you by Steve Swan String Bass. And I've always been impressed by how Steve manages to get basses sounding so vibrant, whether it's a student-level bass or a top-of-the-line professional bass. Here's Steve on some of what he has learned in terms of setup. When steel strings came into general use around 1959, the German bass makers flipped out, and they really got scared that they're going to get big shiploads of basses back that got wrecked by these high-tension steel strings. And so they did three things that really changed the function of the instrument. They shortened the string length, and they lowered the neck angle so the bridges weren't that tall anymore. And then they made the tops a lot thicker. They really wanted to ensure that these basses were not going to come back across the ocean uh, for work anymore. And so the basses tend to sound kind of nasal, and they didn't have any depth. They didn't have a chest voice at all. Yeah. You know, and so what we do with increasing the neck angle, and we can also increase the overstands for modern playing, can get up in a thumb position a lot easier. So a neck reset can accomplish that. Sometimes we'll transplant a neck or make a new neck for these basses that might have a string length that are not friendly to modern playing. Learn more about what Steve can do to get your bass playing better and check out his great selection of basses at steveswanstringbass.com. And thanks for sponsoring the podcast, Steve.
do, do you have, um, are you, uh, in terms of kind of peak creativity, are you a morning person? Are you a night person? Is it totally sporadic? Have you, do you have any patterns that you've sort of noticed or established for yourself? I'm definitely a morning person. So I get up really early and go running. Um, it's just to wake myself up because I find, I find that's the best way for me to start practicing, start creating um, music. So I do that. And then most of my really good practice happens probably before midday or early afternoon. I would say that's when most of my compositions have actually come out, which is interesting to realize because as a gigging musician, I guess night times are often filled or rehearsals often happen kind of later in the day as well. Um, so yeah, I like to start the day early and get the most out of that time before I have anything else on at the moment. Yeah, I'm right. I'm right there with you. That's exactly the same for me. The worst possible time for me to be creative is like 4 PM. That's like, that's like, I, I don't think I've ever written anything that I would ever want to, you know, but like that, those morning hours, I do, I do the exact same thing. I get up, I go for a run and, uh, all, all of a sudden that's like, those are precious times for me. True. Well, there you go. That's, I'm happy to meet someone who also gets up early and goes running before playing. <laughs> It's not always the case. So. It, well, it's not always the case, especially with the musician lifestyle, right? That that's uh, yeah. the, the late nights and that kind of thing. But definitely, uh, yeah. I find if I wake up, if I just no matter how late I've gone to bed, if I just force myself to move in the morning, it's always better anyway mm -hmm. um, for me. But you know, and with coffee, of course, coffee helps. <laughs> <laughs> yep. <laughs> co co coffee, a run, and and those morning hours are 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 the best. Um, you mentioned you mentioned so so you were born in Finland, and uh, I so, a lot of the time I I love just chatting with people for a while before like I'd love to hear your backstory, and I know you come from a musical family, and your brother plays cello on, on some of yeah. your projects, right? So just tell me about you know uh, those your early years uh, and how you discovered music and the bass and all that good stuff. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I was born in Kopio in Finland, which is just about four hours north of Helsinki. Um, cause my mom is Finnish, so she's a classical flautist and my dad is Australian, but they met studying in Prague. And so he moved to Finland as a classical guitarist. So he was doing his doctorate there at Sibelius Academy as well. Um, so yeah, my brother and I, brother Simon and I were both born there and we moved to Australia when I was five. So I'm pretty much a full Australian, but still managed to speak Finnish, which is, I'm happy I retained that side of my original uh, birthplace. So um, yeah, I, I've, my whole life I've just grown up with music. Like my parents were, were playing concerts back in the day and doing all of these music shows for kids. So my brother and I would just go along to all of those and, and you know, be kind of bribed with like lollies or something because we would watch <laughs> the same show like you know multiple times in a week um so I think yeah without realizing it at the time I just was straight away immersed into it since birth and and yeah I, I was actually a classical pianist um before I took up the double bass so um I studied classical I like all through school I had classical piano lessons from age of four and and also was classical flautist through all of school and actually, I got accepted to study classical piano at the University of Queensland, but I just had this sudden, like, realization that I actually didn't want to do that and was like, well, let's let's go into something else. And I played a bit of bass guitar at school in my dad's guitar ensembles because <laughs> <laughs> um, he needed a bass player and he was like, you, do it. And I was like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um so I'm actually really grateful that he, I would say, roped me into that at the time because, yeah, he just, he was kind of the one who pushed me to audition for jazz bass as well. And and because of that, I only I only took up double bass actually seven years ago um, when I was 17. So it's been a kind of late, late um, instrument for me when I was doing all the other ones so intensely before that. Um, but I think because of the classical side of my upbringing, it's been really cool to kind of mix the two influences later in my playing now and composition. Like it, it's been really useful to have that, that piano training, especially just for 
um, harmonic understanding and theoretical understanding before I even started jazz. I think it was really good to combine all of those in the end. So, yeah. That's a very concise background story. <laughs> well, that, that's super. So um, either I, I love knowing how people work. Uh, uh, do you, since you have that extensive piano background, do you, when you write, and maybe particularly when you write not for just bass, do you write at the piano or do you write at the bass or do you write away from the instruments? Or how, how does that work when you're composing? Well, I actually do all three of those. So I, I purposely try and write in different ways for different projects um, just to expand my ideas, I guess, because for the solo project, Vegetable Bass, it's all on the bass because I'm discovering things on the instrument that I want to use um, and using the voice is just part of that when I'm practicing. Um, but with ones like Sprout, which is my chamber, chamber trio with um, my brother on cello and Sophie Min on piano and double bass, that was actually a really fun experiment where I forced myself to only write on the page. Um, so I thought, okay, don't even want to try things on the piano. I just literally sat down and notated it and tried to hear in my head what I thought it would come out as. And it, yeah, it actually worked really well for that group because I wasn't held back by patterns that I would always do on the piano or things like that. So I think inherently i developed a lot of new compositional ideas in that project by limiting myself to just the paper. Mm -hmm. um, and then, yeah, other ones I'll sit down, you know, other projects like the biology of plants or other ones that I, I have, I sit down often at the piano and come up with motifs or melodies and, and later expand those um, within the band. So yeah, it kind of, it, I go through phases for sure. It's, it's kind of nice to, to feel what I, I want to do at the time and just go with that. <laughs> mm, yeah, that's super cool. And, and it's so interesting how I, I love how you're deliberate with picking those uh, modalities. It's, that's that's uh, I've talked to some other composers that that kind of are intentional about that. There's a, a great uh, bass bassist originally from Argentina and composer named Andres Martin. And he's yeah. always changing up his methods, kind of like what you're describing. I think he he carries around his phone. Well, we all carry around our phones, but he has he has his phone yeah, and yeah. he's constantly recording voice memos of an idea. It'll pop in his head and he'll run off and try to get it down. That's another one. I also do that. I find the voice memos so useful because at the time you think, oh, that's kind of cool. And you think you'll remember it. And you, there's no way you'll remember it even 10 minutes later. You go, oh, damn it. I forgot it already. <laughs> So, yeah, I'm a big fan of the voice memo um, technique, I would say. Uh, are, do you still play piano, like, like uh, outside of just when you're composing? Is that something that you've maintained? I, I had all of the intention to maintain it, and I was like, oh, I'm going to, you know, keep learning new classical <clears throat> pieces, and, and it, I definitely didn't stick to my word on that one. <laughs> um, I, I find I, yeah, there's so much so much that I'm focusing on in, in my projects at the moment. And even with the voice now, that's a new focus of mine as well. So I'm kind of, yeah, all of my practice goes to the voice and the bass at the moment, but I, I do still, yeah, I do still sit down at the piano quite often and just noodle and, mm -hmm. and just enjoy sitting there and playing it because it is completely my childhood and it's still there. Yeah. If I want to pick it up again, but just not at not at the moment, I would say it's too much for for one brain. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, you're you're talking earlier about uh, just what a practice session looks like, and you might your your brain moves around from one thing to the next, um, yeah. uh, which which does make sense actually for what you're doing. But but is there any sort of like abstract? technique or I'm or or any way that I mean it's I, I can sort of see following along with especially this vegetable base project how you're sort of taking a few ideas and exploring them in terms of extended techniques yeah. but like is there anything you do consistently on the instrument on a daily basis or semi-daily basis to kind of keep building your uh your maybe classical technique and extended techniques yeah I definitely I I try and warm up with at least half an hour um, minimum of, you know, just proper playing of scales or etudes or even repart studies that I, I did back in the day, like 
all of that all of that stuff is so important to me as well because it's just I'm kind of I'm playing catch up at the moment even with basic fundamentals um because I have this tendency to jump straight to the the cool you know creative stuff and then I realize later down the track that it's so important um to have that basis first before you go into the the fun stuff even in a practice session I've just got to yeah, I'm, I'm learning how to prioritize the, the warm up mm-hmm. side of it. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, I, I love, you know, Francois Rabat. I've got lots of his studies. Um, and I've also got the McTeer daily exercises that I like doing. And, um, recently Phoebe Russell actually passed on to me the Petrarchi exercises as well. Oh yeah. I was studying it back to Maastricht. I'm going to definitely start doing those on a daily basis too, and just stick to my word for once in my life on the practice. <laughs> yeah. I'm such a scatterbrain sometimes and I admit it fully now. I'm like, yep, I am a scatterbrain. That's okay. <laughs> yeah. That, uh, yeah. You, I, I think that's more than okay. <laughs> Thank you, Jason. Thank you. I can sleep now. Yeah, ex- exactly. Um, <laughs> so, so what, um, take, take me, take me five years down the road. Yeah. I mean, you're kind of in the middle of this program right now. So, so you're, you know, you're in school and, and you, the, the, the list of creative projects, which I, I will of course list, you know, I mean, it's, it's, it's remarkable. The, the balls that you have uh, up in the air um, with, mm-hmm. with, with meat shell and with sprout and with uh, your solo base project and the studies, but like, what, what do you see for yourself? If anything different uh, say five years down the road, yeah, I've, I've thought about this a lot recently because now going into second year of studies, um, I'm living with my partner, Andrew, as well. So we're both both originally living in Australia, but we're both at a point now where he's studying saxophone, I'm studying bass, and we're looking ahead to what we want to do next. And I think at the moment the plan is actually, for me at least, to eventually study a PhD back in Melbourne mm. um, just because I – I find that one more year of study into this area of playing and using like the normalization of extended techniques in everyday playing and composition. Um, I find that one year is just such a short time left to do that. So I want to um, focus on the vegetable base for this year and then actually eventually embark on a further research in it again um, in a larger context in Melbourne, just because I've also never lived in Melbourne myself. So I'm looking at the moment to making that happen because there are lots of amazing people um, in that city as well doing really great things. And it's got twice the population of Brisbane, for instance, so it's a lot bigger, lots more happening there at the moment. Um, But having said that, we are also loving Europe, so we we don't know. We're kind of leaving it open if we feel after the next year, year and a half or so that we want to stay and do more Mitchell um, touring there first, you know, prioritize that project a lot. Um, that's also okay. So I guess it will depend on, on opportunities that work for both of us. And, you know, if there's um, income eventually as well, would be great <laughs> not to be a student for five more years. So right. um, yeah, looking at kind of, yeah, putting out the feelers in a few different areas, different options that work for two people, not just for one. So, that, yes, I, I understand that. That's why my wife and I live in San Francisco now is trying to figure out those options. Um, so that's great. Well, Helen, I'm so glad John Goldsby connected us. Uh, you got a you got a lot of career ahead of you. So let's have this be the first of many chats, uh, please. Yes. I would love to. And based on the number of things you got going on, um, you know, anytime something new is happening, just let's I'd, I'd love to chat about it. Um, yeah. And we and we got to we got to get you out uh, to, or you and your partner both out here to California at some point. You'd love it. It's great. I would love to do that. I'm, I'm going to be, you know, in in Canada as soon in Banff, but I sadly can't, can't make more travels around that time anywhere else, but I'm planning to come back definitely next year and do more extensive traveling. So I will, I'll have to get in touch again because more reasons to even come over is great.
Helen, thank you so much for chatting. Folks, check out her website, helensfoboda.com. And I can't wait to do a round two and a round three and hear more about what you're up to. Isn't she an interesting artist? If you have a suggestion for somebody like Helen or, or different from Helen or whatever, Feedback at ContrabassConversations.com will get you in touch with me, and I'd love to hear from you. Even if you don't have a suggestion, just reach out and say hi. That would be great. And if you're not subscribed to the podcast, if you're new to the podcast or you don't know what that means, you can learn more at conversations.com slash subscribe. Contrabass Conversations is produced by Michael Cooper, Steve Hinchy, Trevor Jones, and Mitch Mooring. And Mitch does making beautiful string basses, award-winning basses, and doing great string work in downtown Kilgore, Texas, outside of Dallas. Look him up at mitchmooring.com. And thank you to Krista Copper. By the way, check out her podcast, The Backstage Creative. Very interesting show. And she had Trevor Jones on, who also works on this podcast. So a uh, small world there. But Krista is cataloging and archiving everything we talk about here on the podcast. Super helpful. Thank you, Krista. Thank you for listening. I'm your host, Jason Heath, and we will see you again soon for more life on the low end of the spectrum.